So I spent a lot of time at bookstores when I was 12 or 13, looking at mostly books on natural history and biology and chemistry. And I still have some of those uh, at home. One of these was something from a Time Life series called The Wonders of Life on Earth. I think that's where I first ran across the realization that there was this night-day kind of flip-flop of activity. It went on to talk a little bit about how migration in these birds was controlled by some kinds of timers, some kinds of clocks. And so I thought that was very mysterious, very fascinating. That must have been the first exposure I had to the notion of biological clocks. Well, I've heard from so many of you uh, this morning, I can't thank you enough. This really did take me by surprise. Laurel is my uh, witness. I really had trouble even getting my shoes on this morning. Just, just you know. <laughs> This is a problem that I've had the good fortune to work on for most of my career. It, it actually started uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Texas. Burke Judd came in waving around this paper that was in PNAS from uh, Kanopka and Benzer. I thought these are pretty interesting mutations. These were mutations that uh, affected the period length of the rhythms of these flies or eliminated the rhythms altogether. There was a quantifiability that, that went along with analyzing these mutations that made them seem like, in many ways, an ideal starting point for a for a study of the relationship between genes and behavior. You know, it's not like trying to study learning and memory, for example. These flies had, the, the mutants had the same phenotype, no matter how you, you looked at them. So I wrote to uh, Ron and Seymour. Laboratories had been studying circadian biology for decades, but they had been really just guessing about what the underlying mechanisms might be. And there'd be hypotheses, and uh, the hypotheses didn't really have any uh, direct experimental suggestions. And on the other hand, what Drosophila had were genes in these mutations, like those that Ron and Seymour had found, that suggested that you didn't have to have a hypothesis about how this worked. You didn't have, a, have to guess and guess correctly about what might be uh, the basis uh, for uh, this biology. You could use the fly and the fact that the fly, the mutants, uh, had to be something wrong with the system at the level of the gene and by exploring the genes that were uh, critical to the behavior you could understand what the genes were doing, where are they made, what are they making, what kind of a protein do they uh, produce, then you could go in with, without the baggage of saying I'm going to work on membranes or I'm going to work on transcription or you know pick your model and you'd simply let the fly and its genetics inform you about the path to take. So there are uh, nine or ten really key components that we uh, now know about that interact in different ways to produce uh, an oscillating system that has a, a natural cycle time of about 24 hours. But that again, they, they were revealed by genetics. They were, they were revealed not by anyone thinking, well, how might a circadian clock work? And coming up with, with uh, uh, ideas to test. It was by admitting that you haven't, you haven't got the foggiest idea what makes this system work but say, seeing that a collection of mutations, if broad enough, if it encompasses all there is that the fly can, can produce, uh, can identify elements that are important to circadian rhythms and then by understanding them one by one uh, and then their relationship to, to each other, you can reveal uh, the underlying biology. It was uh, an environment where 
uh, biology was all around you and sort of, I, I was always interested in plants and animals. My father was uh, a pilot in uh, World War II, a, a bomber pilot. When the uh, war ended and he came back uh, home, he went back to Knoxville, Tennessee and met my mother and I think he was by that time not averse to taking risks and they went to uh, Miami for their honeymoon and they decided just to stay. We were close to these tourist attractions. Uh, there was something called the Parrot Jungle, another place called the Monkey Jungle. There was the Serpentarium, the Orchid Jungle. Yeah, the Parrot Jungle was, was especially close. A lot of the birds there were uh, free to fly wherever they wanted. It wasn't, it, they weren't uh, caged. And so you'd walk out into the backyard and you might see a toucan or a parrot. You know, you'd, you'd see native wildlife too. My sister and I caught a small alligator when I, <laughs> when I was about 11 or 12 in elementary school. I can remember having an interest in science, not just biology, but also chemistry. And at one point got a chemistry set. You could get these models, something called the visible man and the visible head and, and this is at 11 or 12 and the kids, you know, especially my sister's friends, thought I was really weird that I'd sit here putting people together, taking them apart. And we were in a neighborhood where uh, down the street there was a kid whose father worked at uh, Porsche and so he was always bringing home these cars. You know, we would go down and watch him overhaul, you know, a car, but then uh, kids, the, the, the same kids would be building their own vehicles for, for running around illegally in the neighborhood. I built a, a go-kart. That taught me a lot about mechanics and the way things can be put together to work. I think even if biology and machinery, you know, motorized machinery, they're not equivalent, but, but just somehow thinking about what makes something work. That was of interest and I think it was useful to learn about. I was much more enchanted by what you could prove to yourself than what you had to sort of put faith into. It was thinking ahead that was exciting. It was thinking, well, where will this field be in five or 10 years? And, and that's what you want to be thinking about. Those are the questions you want to have in mind. There's a certain combination of risk taking and novelty. Uh, circadian biology was something very different. Nobody done any molecular biology on circadian rhythms. And so far as we knew when we started, nobody else was planning on doing it. And it was behavior. And it was the relationship between genetics and behavior. And there been lots of speculation, but nobody really had a had a handle on how you learn more about this, and there, were a lot, there was a lot of mystery. I saw that there were, you know, these mutants to make a beginning on, you know, in comparing that problem to everything else that was out there, it seemed to be uh, uh, the most uncertain 